Chinese President Xi Jinping tells Putin that he needs to stop using North Korean troops. It seems that Putin's North Korea gamble is coming back to bite him. First, we had South Korea stepping up their support for Ukraine after hearing that North Korean troops are helping Russia. Then, we have Chinese president getting mad at Putin for using North Korea, bringing in a third country in this war and expanding this war like never before. And on top of that, we have Russian soldiers, Russian troops who are working with North Korean troops getting mad at the North Korean counterparts. We actually have intercepted communication from the front line and we can hear the Russian soldiers getting mad at the North Korean troops they have to deal with. In fact, going as far as to call them Chinese. So let's get into all this and more in today's video. Like always, be sure to hit the like button. It helps us out tremendously, especially considering just yesterday, one of our videos was demonetized minutes after uploading. So your likes really help us out. Now we'll get into President Xi scolding Putin in a second, but first let's listen to Russian soldiers complaining about North Korean soldiers. These pictures of North Koreans training in the far east of Russia have sparked a lot of speculation over Russia's plans in Ukraine. In intercepted communications from the front line, obtained by the Defense Intelligence of Ukraine, Russian soldiers can be heard complaining about their new allies. The North Koreans are codenamed the K Battalion. Yeah, but He's standing there talking to this guy about the K Battalion. He was just talking about the K Battalion. I asked, who gets the weapons, the ammo for them? We did get rations. And from what I hear, the brigade gets it. And he's like, why the brigade? You receive everything. We can also hear them refer rudely to the North Koreans as the Chinese. The audio intercepts also reveal plans to have one interpreter and three senior officers for every 30 North Korean men. The Kremlin had initially dismissed allegations of North Korean troop deployments, but at the recent BRICS summit, Russian President Vladimir Putin appeared to acknowledge that Pyongyang had sent soldiers to the country. Now, two other big news that happened on this topic was the fact that North Korea and Russia actually confirmed that North Korean troops are in Russia. Now, we already had Ukrainians and South Koreans confirming this. Also, we had Lloyd Austin, U.S. Defense Secretary, confirming this too. Now, everyone is giving out different numbers. U.S. is saying 3,000 North Korean soldiers, while Ukrainians and South Koreans are saying as high as 20,000 soldiers are in Russia. So numbers are big and it's also reported that more soldiers are coming as we speak. But so far we haven't had any comment from Putin, Russia and North Korea. But now it seems they have kind of confirmed it. Listen to it yourself. Uh, let me just start by saying that even though it is late Friday night, we now are actually getting reaction from North Korea itself uh, through North Korean state media. Now, a military official isn't explicitly confirming the presence of North Korea troops, Korean troops in Russia with this potential deployment to Ukraine, uh, but it's not denying it either. In fact, uh, a, this official goes on to say that if this is the case, it is conforming with international law. It's following the rules of the global stage. So that is what we are hearing from North Korea. Uh, we are also hearing a very muted response uh, from from Vladimir Putin himself. He uh, acknowledged that uh, Russia is in contact with North Korea, uh, but not not so much of the specifics, basically telling the rest of the world uh, to mind your own business. Uh, let's listen to some remarks from Vladimir Putin uh, that he made following that global summit you alluded to uh, as it wrapped up on Thursday. Let's listen. As for our relations with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, as you know, our strategic partnership treaty was ratified only today. There is Article 4, and Russia never doubted that the DPRK is serious about Russian cooperation. But what we will do and how we will do it is our business. Now we move the focus to China. China is, of course, North Korea's biggest trading partner and one of the biggest backer of the Kim regime. So you would think that they wouldn't have a problem with China and Russia making a military deal together, right? Where Russia is giving Kim money, satellite info, and Russia in return is getting shells, ammunition, and soldiers. But it seems like China is not happy about this deal. Now in a second, we will get into why this is something China is not happy about. But first, I would like to remind you that many people do believe that one person in this world who can stop this war is Xi Jinping. If Xi Jinping picks up the phone and calls Putin to call off this war, he will stop. 
In fact, we have proof of how much influence China has over Russia. China is the one who's holding back Russia from using any kind of nukes. I guess holding back would be a nicer way of putting it. China has basically forbidden Russia from using any nukes if they want this continued Chinese support. And Russian economy would be pretty much dead if it wasn't for China and India. They're the one who are funding it by buying all that oil and they're the one, especially China is the one funding it by exporting all these Western electronics that's basically going into all these Russian missiles that's targeting inside Ukraine. So first, let's listen to what Xi Jinping said to Putin about this North Korea deals and North Korean troops in Russia. Then we'll, we'll listen to why he's not happy about it. One of the biggest geopolitical event that the whole world is waiting for is the upcoming presidential election. Now, there are a lot of questionable trading sites that have popped up around this. But you always want to be careful with anything that's not approved by proper authorities. This is where today's sponsor, Kalsi, comes in. Kalsi is the first legal exchange where you can bet on any event including but not limited to elections. Do you think you know who will win the presidential election? Or how many seats the Democrats or Republicans will win in the House or Senate? Well, Kalsi finally gives you a legal way to trade on that. Bet on the outcome of these elections and much more. In fact, Kalsi went to court and won legal approval for election betting for the first time in over 100 years. They have markets on who will win the presidential election, who will control the House and the Senate, who will win swing states, and more. Kalsi is being used by hundreds of thousands of people and has facilitated over $1 billion worth of trades. Let's take an example. Of course, you can bet on the presidential election and other things like interest rate hikes. Here, if you think the Fed will only cut rates three times this year, then you can place your bet on it and more than 3x your money if you end up right. That's pretty good. So, put your money where your mouth is and sign up using our link, calci.com slash business basics. And the first 500 traders who deposit $100 will get a free $20 credit. Now, back to the video. Now, moving on to why China is not happy. Here, we have to think about it. China, of course, doesn't want Russia to lose. It would rather Russia win than lose, because at the end of the day, it is still in Russia's corner. But it's also China makes most of its money exporting to the West. It exports more than half a trillion dollars to US alone every single year. That's millions of millions of jobs in China that's dependent on having that export, having that trade flow smoothly. As this war expands more and more, China knows the more pressure will be put on it to stop supporting Russia, stop buying the oil, or stop exporting to the West. It would be forced to pick one side. On top of that, as more countries get involved, the risk of escalation goes up. Now, NATO has not sent any troops to Ukraine, especially to fight. If North Korea gets involved, North Korean troops are fighting against Ukrainian troops, then it makes it easier for NATO to justify to sending troops to Ukraine because it's not going to be the first group to cause that escalation. China has its own interests that it puts above helping Putin or helping Russia. And in fact, this is something we talked about in our podcast with Ben Hodges. So let's listen to that point because he explains it much better than I ever could. What, what is their strategic interest? Obviously, it's uh, regime survival, number one. Uh, China is not an ally of North Korea, although I think the China, because the Chinese know that if if and when Korea, North Korea finally does implode because of all the you know, the enormous problems that North Korea has in terms of starvation of their own people, um, at some point, does that crack? I don't know, but you'll have millions of really hungry North Koreans pouring into China. So China um, keeps an eye on that, and I think the Chinese like having a buffer between them and a U.S.-backed South Korea. Um, North Korea does have a friend, though, in Russia. Uh, I mean, you remember Putin was just there not too long ago. And so um, I think that there's a, uh, a relationship that's based on uh, shared some shared uh, objectives. And probably Russia is able to pay North Korea um, a lot of money for this ammunition that they get by selling oil to India and China, oil and gas still. Um, now, what we don't know is the quality of the ammunition that's been provided. I've, I've seen mixed reports. But even if 50% of it was rotten, 50% of 3 million, that's a lot of artillery ammunition. So it's not inconsequential. Um, uh, 
and I'm, I'm hoping that at one point uh, the Ukrainians or somebody will figure out a way to disrupt this supply chain. The Ukrainians did destroy a railroad tunnel early in the process, but that was repaired or bypassed. Uh, and so it's going to take a sustained effort to really disrupt this effort where North Korea moves ammunition by ship up to Russia, to a Russian port, and then it gets on trains uh, and, and moves across to uh, moves across Russia to Ukraine. Now, how many Ukraine, North Korean troops are there? Uh, I'm not surprised that there would be officers that are there, uh, either as technical help. Uh, I don't, I've heard that the North Koreans were going to provide engineering units, for example, combat engineers. I, I can't assess the quality of what they've provided yet. But this would be a time where the United States and South Korea should remind North Korea that there's a very large, potent South Korean force with a large American contingent in South Korea uh, to make sure that North Korea doesn't feel like they can just take everything they have and give it to Russia. Now, there's one thing that he says is really important. Now, North Korea is sending a lot of shells to Russia. In fact, the numbers we have been shared so far that is sending around 3 million shells per year so far. And on top of that, it's plans on sending 6 million more. But the problem is not all those shells work as expected. But even if 50% of them don't work, that still gives 50% of the shells that can cause havoc in Ukraine. And just by sheer number, it's deadly and it's problematic. The same thing with their military. Even though they don't have experienced military, even though they don't have a well-equipped military, what they do have is number. Around 29% of their adult population is part of the military over 1 million military personnel, making it one of the biggest military in terms of numbers. So even though they might not have the highest grade technology than US technology, they do have numbers. And if they become part of this war, it could lead to an escalation that's hard to predict and hard to manage maybe. So let's watch this clip that explains a little bit more about their military size and military capability. Now, earlier we did do a segment on Russian jets entering Alaska airspace. This is not a one-off instance. They've been doing it pretty regularly. Just a week ago, four Russian aircrafts entered Alaska's ADIF or Air Defense Identification Zone. Then American F-16s were scrambled to intercept the aircrafts and the situation took a dangerous turn. Just watch it yourself. American Defense Command called the conduct of the Russian Su-35 unsafe, unprofessional, and endangered everyone. You can clearly see why this is dangerous just from these images. These aircrafts are flying at an extremely high speed, anywhere from 500 miles per hour to 1300 miles per hour. That's why the American fighter pilot was audibly frustrated when he saw how close the Russian fighter jet got. But what's even more worrying is this is not the first time. In fact, just this year, Russian aircrafts have entered American ADIS 25 different times. Just last month, the uptick was so much that the US military actually had to deploy troops and mobile rocket launchers to Shemya Island, which is right here on the map. Soon after this, Putin gave his big show for the Western audience where he said if US gives permission to Ukraine to strike inside Russia using American weapons, then Russia will nuke USA. Aggression against Russia by any non-nuclear weapon state, but with the participation or support of a nuclear weapon state, should be regarded as a joint attack on the Russian Federation. Putin has said that he'll nuke US. Or I guess in broader terms, he's saying any country that gives Ukraine permission to strike inside Russia using their weapons, Russia will respond by striking that country. Using the same logic, Ukraine now has permission to strike inside Iran, China, and North Korea. What makes it even more clear that he's just putting on a show for the Western audience is the fact that he's telling the West one thing and then he's turning around and telling the Russian people a completely different thing. Also, I think Putin forgets that Russia isn't the only country with nukes. In fact, NATO has more nukes than Russia. And as of 2024, US actually has more nukes than Russia. Better yet, American nukes and NATO nukes actually work. 
Unlike in Russia, where nuclear missiles just blow up in the silo and defense contractors who are contracted to defend the border actually just pocket the money so a small country like Ukraine can just invade and take up territory in Russia. But anyways, let's first listen to this new nuclear doctrine that Putin just announced and then we'll talk about why this is all just a big bluff. At present, our nuclear triad remains the most important security guarantee for our state and citizens, an instrument for maintaining strategic parity and balance of forces in the world. At the same time, we can see that the modern military political situation is rapidly changing, and we have to factor that in, including the emergence of new sources of military threats and risks for Russia and our allies. It is important to predict the development of the situation and adjust the provisions of the strategic planning document in accordance with current realities. Aggression against Russia from any non-nuclear state, but involving or supported by any nuclear state as their joint attack against the Russian Federation. It also states clearly the conditions for Russia's transition to the use of nuclear weapons. We will consider such a possibility once we receive reliable information about a massive launch of air and space attack weapons and their crossing our state border. I mean strategic and tactical aircraft, cruise missiles, UAVs, hypersonic and other aircraft. Now, most of you guys know, and I know, he's just bluffing. The audience is the Western audience who's going to freak out at the word nukes. They're going to hear nukes and they're going to feel like US should just back out. But at the end of the day, that's the goal. Putin wants a cheap victory just by yelling nukes every time he's scared of something. And scared he is right now. Ever since Ukraine has invaded, started their counteroffensive in the Kursk region, the pressure on Putin is mounting. And that's why he's upping the rhetoric to scare people even more, to scare normal citizens. And that's why I have a big request for you guys. If you can just hit the like button down below, that helps us out in the algorithm and that just pushes this video to more and more people. So please hit the like button down below and share the video in social media. But you know what makes this situation even more laughable is Putin is getting forgetful. I guess that just comes with old age. He's about to turn 72. This speech that you just listened to happened on September 25th. So not even a week after, just five days after, he releases another video that basically kills his whole argument that if Western weapons are used on Russia, he'll use the nukes. Дорогие друзья, уважаемые... Today, on September 30th, we mark the day of reunification of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics and the Zaporozhye and Kherson regions with Russia. I wholeheartedly congratulate all citizens of our country on this truly momentous event. We have come to this moment through years of challenges and difficult trials. We knew the unbearable conditions under which Donbass lived for eight long years, enduring constant shelling and blockades, and the oppression faced by the people of Novorossiya. They stood up against the armed coup in Kiev and resisted the neo-Nazi dictatorship that sought to sever them forever from their historic motherland, from Russia. We did not abandon our brothers and sisters and sought to achieve a peaceful resolution to this grave conflict. You know how those talks ended, with lies, deceit, and betrayal by the Western elites, who in that time turned Ukraine into their colony, into a military outpost aimed at Russia. They systematically instilled hatred and radical nationalism, fueled hostility towards everything Russian, supplied weapons, sent mercenaries and advisors, and train the Ukrainian army for a new war so that again, as in the spring and summer of 2014, to launch a punitive operation in the southeast. Their targets included not only Donbass, but also Crimea and other Russian regions. So basically he's saying that Donetsk, Crimea, Luhansk, they're all part of Russia and he welcomes all those Russians, right? He celebrates the day they joined Russia. So what is he saying basically? He's saying, if Western weapons are used on Russia, he'll launch nukes. But then he's saying all these territories are part of Russia that are Ukrainian territories. But the Western weapons are being used there anyway. Where are the nukes? That's basically the point I'm trying to make. Like this is nothing new, but everyone's acting like it's such a big deal. Just the fact that he changed the Russian nuclear doctrine. Oh my God. But he's a dictator. Like he doesn't need the law on his side if he wants to fire the nukes. All he's doing is just upping the rhetoric on the bluff so people take him more seriously. As more pressure is put on him, he knows the only way he can survive 
is by making sure the Western countries don't support Ukraine fully. And this is not just me saying it. Experts are saying it. In a second, I'll show you a clip of like respected military experts making the same point. Everyone has an opinion on everything, right? And this is one of those situations where listening to everyone's opinion is actually very dangerous. And I'm including my opinion in that category too, because this is not some small matter. This is like Ukrainians are literally fighting for their existence. So yeah, basically you shouldn't be listening to every opinion on the internet. And on top of that, you shouldn't be scared when Putin makes a empty nuclear threat and then bots on Twitter and bots on YouTube are just spreading, spreading the Russian propaganda to make you scared. By the way, this is a little bit of a joke, but it does have some truth behind it. In last six months, there have been a lot of comments that I have seen online that always start with, as a US citizen, I think Putin is right. As a US citizen, I think Russia deserves to win or something like that. They always make sure to point out that they are a US citizen. And I guess kind of makes sense when you're sitting in Moscow and tweeting and commenting from there, you have to make sure to make it clear that you're a US citizen. But anyway, let's listen to this clip of Ben Hodges explaining exactly why Russia is not going to use nukes. So I, I think the chance of Putin using a nuclear weapon is zero. Um, and you're right. We're talking mainly about tactical nuclear weapons that would be employed somewhere on a battlefield in Ukraine or potentially as a demonstration somewhere else uh, just to, to scare everybody that, look, we have nuclear weapons. Of course, a strategic nuclear weapon, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, um, which is what we feared during the Cold War, that's something that would generate immediately an American response that would lead to the destruction of so much of, of Russia. So that's that's even less than zero of that happening. The, the scenario that we're really talking about is a tactical uh, nuclear weapon. And I, I just believe, even though Russia has thousands of nuclear warheads, uh, and they clearly do not care about how many innocent people they kill, including their own, there's no benefit to them. For them, the real benefit comes from the threat that they might do it. And they see that we have been hesitating for years now that they might use a nuclear weapon. So we stop short of delivering what Ukraine needs to actually win. I think the fact that China and India have both told the Kremlin do not use a nuclear weapon because they don't want any disruption to the cheap oil and gas they get from UK. And um, I think that the, uh, the Russians do believe President Biden when he said there would be catastrophic consequences for Russia if they did it. And this is nothing new. Right now, it's West giving permission to Ukraine to strike inside Russia using Western weapons. Earlier, it was F-16s. Before that, it was tanks. Before that, it was Western weapons. The red lines are always there. And Putin always has some kind of red lines because he knows even if they don't work, like even if they don't like stop the decision from coming, what they are doing is delaying the decision. And that's definitely helping Russia. And on top of that, they've been yelling about nuking London for a long time now and nothing has come. So now they're just upping it one more step and saying, oh, they'll nuke US too if the US gives permission to strike inside Russia. So here first I have a clip from almost two years ago where he was saying that if we give Ukraine tanks, if we give them Western weapons, he will use nukes. He reminds us Russia is a nuclear state. And, and if I didn't tell you this was two years ago, you would think this just happened a few weeks ago. So here, watch this clip. We will do everything to ensure safe conditions to hold the referendums so that people can express their will. We will support the decision on their future made by the residents of Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, Zaporizhia and Kherson regions. In its aggressive and anti-Russian policy, the West has crossed every line. We have constant threats against our country and our people. Some irresponsible politicians in the West speak not only about delivering Ukraine, long-range weaponry, missile systems that allow Kiev to strike Crimea and other Russian regions. These are acts of terror, including Western weapons, are already being carried out in border regions in Belgorod and Kursk regions. Nuclear blackmail has also been used. We are talking not only about the shelling of the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, encouraged by the West, which threatens to cause a nuclear catastrophe, but also about statements from senior representatives of NATO countries about the possibility and permissibility of using weapons of mass destruction against Russia, nuclear weapons. 
I would like to remind those who make such statements about Russia that our country also possesses various means of destruction, and in some cases they are more modern than those of NATO countries. When the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, we of course will use all the means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people. This is not a bluff, and those who try to blackmail us with nuclear weapons should know that the weather vane can turn and point towards them. And the big reason the rhetoric is going up for Putin right now is because the pressure on him is increasing. First of all, the war has reached Russia, that means Russian people are learning more and more about it. And on top of that, the Russian casualties are going up. Just recently, he announced that Russia is about to sign 130,000 more conscripts in just the next month. So the pressure internally is increasing. And on top of that, Iran just publicly said, the new Iranian president, he said that Iran never approved of Russian aggression against Ukrainian territory. On top of that, he supports all peaceful solution and believes the only way to resolve this crisis is through dialogue. Which is crazy. Again, I wouldn't put too much emphasis. Like, he could be, or I'm pretty sure he's definitely lying because at the end of the day, Iran is providing so much of the Sahed drones to Russia. And on top of that, they just shared the designs. So Russia is now starting to manufacture these on their own. But just the fact that he's saying this publicly doesn't look good for Putin. All this time, the whole argument Russian people and the Russian officials have had, like all the Russian government official, is that they're on the right. They're trying to help people, the Russian people who are suffering in Ukraine. But at the UN assembly that just ended, there weren't many countries that were supporting Russia. In fact, many, and I mean countless countries, actually spoke up against Russian delegates and spoke up against the Russian aggression that's going on in Ukraine. And I'm thinking Iran was one country that Russia was counting on to show some kind of support at least. And Iranian president goes out and basically says, hey, we didn't approve this invasion. But yeah, the big reason Putin is upping his rhetoric is because the walls are closing in on him on all sides. As more and more Russians start to doubt him, it presents an opportunity for anyone like Prigozhin, anyone who wants to remove Putin, they can do it and have a higher chance of success. Again, it's not going to be an easy task or it's not going to be like a no-risk task. But